Hi, I'm Pete Duncanson, Media Arts Pastor, and I'd like to take a moment to say thank you for being here. If you are physically here with us today, please be aware that for your safety, we are practicing social distancing and ask you to respect those that are using precautions as well. If you'd like to know more about what is going on right here at Central, whether upcoming events or just learning about who we are, check us out on the web, Facebook, and yes, we even have an app for that. If the ministry at Central has blessed you and you would like to give, you can do that multiple ways. By using the physical boxes located in the back by the sound booth, through online giving, or even through our app. Thanks again for joining us today, and God bless. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. You can be seated this morning. His love for us is a firm foundation. Amen. And that all started there in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. Praise God. More than. Remember when we used to be looking forward to saying, well, it'll be 2,000 years here soon. When Now we're saying, well, it's way past 2,000 years. Where are you at, Jesus? Get back here and get us. Amen. My goodness. I don't know if you saw all over the weekend, but Britain has identified another strain of this virus that they feel is more contagious. There's a, uh, some sort of uh, cyber attack on a lot of our things here in government and industry in the U.S. There's enough for you to run to Jesus and say, Heaven help us. Amen. Turn your Bible this morning to the book of Matthew, chapter 1. The book of Matthew, chapter 1. And um, I'm going to read a verse to you. and You tell me if you've ever heard anybody preach from the genealogies in the Bible. All right? <laughs> it's not easy. It takes a, a professional to be able to preach from the genealogy. Where's the Old Testament one at? Is it in uh, Leviticus? Um, so-and-so begat so-and-so, or is it in uh, Chronicles? Maybe there's one both. Um, my Old Testament brain's a little foggy this morning. But here's the one in the New Testament. The New Testament begins also with a genealogy. And uh, we're just going to take one verse of it. We're not going to read the whole genealogy. Although it is a very important part of the Christmas story, we'll kind of get the last one that I think sums it up. 16, Matthew 1 and 16. Jacob was the father of Joseph the husband of Mary. Mary gave birth to Jesus, who was called the Messiah. So we're going to do a begat this morning, and the King James will begat. And uh, I'm going to preach from the genealogy, hallelujah. Well, we're not going to stay here very long, but we need to know that Joseph was the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, but Joseph was not the father. And that's what that verse is saying. So today we want to talk about what is Christmas all about? What is Christmas? I, I think it's very easy for us as believers to say, well, I know what Christmas is about, and by and large we do, but I'm not sure that everybody who lives in America, as a matter of fact, I know that not everybody who lives in America understands anything about Christmas. They don't understand the basics, they don't understand the depth, they don't understand the blessing, the benefit, they don't understand the responsibilities. And today we're going to look at all of that and more, I hope, in just a few moments. He is the husband of Mary, but not the father of her son. And that's where this all begins, right there. And the Bible then, the New Testament, having begun this way, all that it does is expound upon that, build upon that, develop that theme, what that means, the implications for you and I, as well as the spiritual world, what it did for mankind, what it offers to all of us, what it means in the end, how it closes out. Everything revolves around that verse, and the previous verses bring you to there. And I think what can be interesting as well, when you think of the genealogy, look at what God is saying all through these generations, all through this family and the families of the earth, I've had a plan. 
in your generations, in the genealogy of your family, God has had a plan, and that plan is oriented around this genealogy, but his plan is unique to you and your family. Hallelujah. There's a purpose for your life. Christmas says that God has that purpose for you and your kids and grandkids. Well, let's go to Luke chapter 1 now. Luke chapter 1. Now that we've touched on the genealogy, and I know that it's hard to get that any more than that out of the begats, uh, but I thought it'd be fun to start there today. Luke chapter 1, look at verse 76. I, this is one of my favorite parts of the Christmas story, not as emphasized as the, as the others, but I love Zechariah, uh, his, his response after he's allowed to talk again. You know, I, I love the whole story of Zechariah. And the challenges that he presents to God and God's response to him, uh, fine. Just If you're not going to say the right thing, just don't say anything. Well, I've got... And then that's it for nine months. (laughs) How would you like to have that happen to you the next time you say to God, well, I don't... (laughs) And God says, well, okay. If you don't, then just don't say anything. Uh, thank the Lord that God knows our hearts because I have no doubt Zacharias spent time communing with the Lord in his heart. Amen? But when the strings, I think the King James uses that terminology, when the strings of his tongue are loosed, uh, this is what we find out. Now we're not going to read the whole thing, but 76. And you, my little son, he's speaking prophetically by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is operating in one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit that we read about in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 14. And here we hear his prophecy, his prophetic declaration. You, my little son, will be called the prophet of the Most High because you will prepare the way for the Lord. You will tell his people how to find salvation through forgiveness of their sins because of God's tender mercy. The morning light from heaven is about to break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide us to the path of peace. Hallelujah. Number one. What is Christmas all about? It's about the visitation of light from heaven. The visitation of light from heaven. There are untold numbers of religions that claim to have the light to illuminate the path to heaven. There are untold promises. If you'll do this or give that, untold numbers of paths that are supposedly illuminated as the way to heaven. But I've got to tell you, there's one that makes that claim and then backs it up with resurrection power. I uh, saw (laughs) saw this week that uh, Mr. Tom Cruise was in the news a lot. Seems to have lost his temper with people overseas where they were filming somewhere outside of the U.S., and he is just beside himself because they seem not to have recognized his saving power through the Church of Scientology. He's Messiah, Savior, and he lost his temper and screamed at them because they were either too close together, not wearing a mask, or whatever the case may be. And uh, I saw a picture because with him always comes a picture of the Church of Scientology, and up on top was kind of like a cross on their building. And I was like, well, what, what, whoa, time out here. What What gives? You're not going by way of the cross. You reject the cross. You hate the cross. You despise the cross. Well, what's happening here? But Scientology claims to be a light that illuminates the way to eternal life. But none of them have the power of the Holy Spirit anointing people and speaking through them. And Zechariah could have said one of 10 million things, I suppose. You don't get the chance to talk for eight, nine months, and all of a sudden you get to talk. It seems to me there are lots of things you'd say. Where are my car keys? How much money's in my bank? You know, what's been happening? And did you, did you understand all the things I was trying to say? But the moment he opens his mouth, now I'm going to tell you the Holy Spirit doesn't do this unless you're prepared. So I see in Zechariah a lot of preparation while he's just 
thinking and pondering and stewing on what's been happening for nine months. And when he speaks, it's simply a continuation of what's been happening inside. But let's now look at what it is that he actually says. John would show the way to heaven. You, my little son, will be called the prophet of the Most High. You will not be the Most High, but you will be called the prophet of the Most High. Now, there are other religions that do not like the fact that John is called the prophet. They believe they have the prophet. But the Bible says that John, John the Baptist, is the prophet of the Most High. Hello? Yeah, John the Baptist is the prophet. Because, now this is an an important word. It's, it's there to help us understand the reasoning behind him being the prophet. <clears throat> because here are the requirements for the prophet of the Most High. You've got to prepare the way for the Lord to come. You've got to tell his people how to find salvation and how to be forgiven of their sins. You've got to declare that God's tender mercy, the morning light, is about to break upon us. And when he hears that, now that... I know he's, he's just a baby, but as that echoes through his soul for the years of his formation and development, and then while he's out in the wilderness, I have no doubt that his late father's prophetic word continues to echo in his soul, having been written down, declared over him, probably wrapped on his wrist or on his forehead along with God's word, and again and again and again he says, I will declare the way of the Most High. So that when Jesus comes up out of the water and the Holy Spirit comes down on him, John says, that's him. That's him. My father had the Holy Spirit come upon him. I had the Holy Spirit come upon me. And Almighty God said, when you see the Spirit, you know who he is. You've understood a communication with him. You've had a relationship with him. And when you see him, after all of the years of your life, after all that your father went through, knowing the Holy Spirit mysteriously and invisibly, when you see him in bodily form, come on the man that I've raised up, you'll know he's the one. That's why when Jesus comes up out of the baptismal waters, John says, that's him, follow him. But but, but John, you've got tens or maybe hundreds of thousands of people flocking into your ministry. You're shaking the nation of Israel and having impact on all the other nations. This is your moment. This is your day to shine. Follow him. I must now decrease. He must increase. All of that because of Zechariah's prophecy here. And a couple of things that I think is, are important for us. The coming morning light. Do you see that in the New Living? That, that phrase in 78. Because of God's tender mercy, the morning light from heaven. You've got to understand that the morning light that we have comes from heaven. It does not come from among men. Jesus picked up on that and said to the religious leaders, Hey, John's baptism, from God or from men? From heaven or from earth? (laughs) They wouldn't answer, would they? Because for John, this was about making sure the door to heaven would be open for everybody. That the gates would be swung open wide and that the invitation would go to whosoever will. You and I have to see the prophetic implication of this. That that morning light was not just a spiritual leader. Not just some governmental or religious ruler. But he was from heaven. He did not come up from among men and go to heaven. He came down from heaven heaven to be among men hallelujah and he's the morning light praise God we sang about it in that one chorus this morning John was not the morning light but he who would be born in just a few months would be now I think that this is in for us critically important because of verse 79 to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death And around the world now, we understand a phrase like that. Not in our lifetimes, certainly, have we ever seen firsthand the world from country to country, culture to culture, 
people aware of what it means to sit in the shadow of death. Where you worry every day about loved ones. And you worry, if not about yourself being sick, what if I give this virus? What if I am a carrier and don't even know it and I give it to somebody and they become very ill? And that shadow, he doesn't say just death, but it's the shadow of death. That foreboding can be the worst part. That wondering and questioning and waiting and waiting and news report after news report. And we've been under this drip, drip, drip for what, nine months now or whatever? And it is just agonizing as we just sit and wait. At the same time, the powers that be try to take things away and say, you can't have that. You can't have that. And the dripping becomes even darker. Zacharias said, for those who sit in the shadow of death, for those who are under that, that kind of covering of anxiety and that covering of worry and fear, I've got good news for you. The king of king of glory is coming, the king of deliverance, the king of healing and health, the king of life. In spite of the shadow of death, he will come. And there's no stopping him. What a powerful prophecy. <clears throat> now when we read about Mary going to Elizabeth in that part of the, <clears throat> of the story and her visiting there, I'm sorry, <clears throat> I prayed over everything this morning but my throat, as she's there, we don't see in those interactions much about Zechariah. He's, you know, he's been in the story at the beginning, and we just get the picture that God has said, hey, time out, man. You're going to sit over there in the corner, and you're not going to say a word, and you're not really going to be relevant to this story until I say. As he comes back into the, into the story, I just can't help but marvel. This guy's a priest. He was in the temple. This isn't a nobody. And the moment the Holy Spirit comes upon him, pow, this prophetic unction to even speak about, not only his little one, you, my little son. I love that. You, you my little guy. You're going to be the forerunner of the next little guy. And as much as I am going to be proud of you and you're, you're the son, the child of my old age and, and I cannot rejoice enough in what God has given my wife and I in these older years of our lives as our journey winds down, it's just really overwhelming. In spite of how impressed I am, excited I am, thrilled I am, it's the other one that is the light from heaven. And uh, what, a, what an encouragement to you and I. What is Christmas all about? Number one, it is about the visitation of light from heaven. I don't know why we decorate trees and put up garland and have string lights everywhere. But for me, I hope it is for you. But for me, it just simply is a representation, crude, very, very base and difficult to make much more out of it because we're so limited in what we've got. But somehow it is symbolic that the light is from heaven. Amen. The, uh, the little planets are going to line up sometime. I thought they lined up a week or two ago. Uh, they line up tonight, tomorrow night, the next night, some night. I don't know. They're all excited about this big light in the sky. What I can tell you is <laughs> that's not the light. The stars are dwarfed in his presence the, the stars bow. The angels, including Gabriel, bows before him. Oh, think about the light from heaven. Here's the second thing. Go, to, go back to Matthew chapter 1. Don't you wish God put it all just in one place, the Christmas story, so you didn't have to jump back and forth? Matthew 1. Come on, you guys are allowed to be in amening this morning. Matthew chapter 1. Look at verse 18 now. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. So keep that in mind that as God switches from Old Covenant, now it's taken about 400 years. You can turn the page from Malachi to Matthew, literally one or two pages. But it's 400 years between the Testaments and the, the operations with Israel. They've, they've basically felt that this was their dark ages. 
And there were no prophetic voices and nothing's happening. And I think, again, that's why understanding what, what happens to Zechariah is so critical. There has been no prophecy. And this guy, who just was in the temple, says, I had a visitation from the angel of God. And the Holy Spirit has come upon me. And i got to tell you this. And as we pick up the early part of the story, isn't it, isn't it just like God? Doesn't it make good common sense that you would immediately fill in the blank? In verse 16, we read the word Messiah. And now in verse 18, this is how Jesus, the Messiah, was born. His mother, Mary, was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Number two this morning, the virgin birth of the Messiah. What is Christmas all about? It is about the virgin birth of the Messiah. But if you have never confessed being a sinner, repented of your sins, you cannot believe that. You may hear it, you may say, I agree, I understand, all of that, but you do not biblically believe it. And there's no opportunity for you to go any further until you do. This doesn't happen because you read the book and so, well, I can see right there on the page the words and it makes sense, uh, I'm okay with that. It doesn't happen because you say, well, I was born in America and I, I served in the country, uh, armed forces and I worked for the U.S. government, and that's just the way we are, or at least used to be as Americans. No, it doesn't happen unless you've repented. Can't. Not possible. This belief doesn't originate in your mind or brain. It doesn't start with your will. It starts with God's will, and God's will is that all men everywhere should repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the order. You don't believe first. doesn't happen that way. Now, granted, you can be in the process. I'm not saying it's always instantaneous. And I'm not saying that everybody at the time understands the distinction. But what I am telling you theologically is you have to confess and then belief is given to you. You have to confess and faith comes alive inside. This is a miracle. The birth of Jesus is a miracle. 2,000 years ago in the little town of Bethlehem, lying so still that we could see the town somehow. And it's still a miracle today when you invite him in. It's never changed. It, it isn't a miracle for Mary, but not for you. It's a miracle for you as well. Now, it gives us some detail here. A lot of power in the world. There is electric power, alternating current and direct current. And that electric power can be generated by lightning, as Mr. Franklin found out, it can be generated by nuclear, uh, something, fusion, fission, something like, come on, what is it? Do we use fusion and we're hoping to get to fission or we use fission and we're trying to get to fusion? Anyway, something happens in the pop. Whatever happens in your, in your cola, that's what we make nuclear power out of. And there's all kinds of breakdowns of other generations. You can make electric by coal, you know, and steam and all that. And there, I was looking under power online, and I hadn't thought about it. There were most of the articles, when I put in classifications of power, most of the articles had to do with leadership and power over people. And I hadn't thought about any of that. I'm not going to show you them today. Some articles said there were five classifications. Some said six. Some said seven. Uh, but I did read them because I thought, oh, I'm a pastor. I should be using some of that power. And I didn't even know I had it. But here's what you and I need to know. There's Holy Spirit power. And it's unclassified. It cannot be classified by any system in this world. There are no thermometers that can, can help us to understand, no meters of measurement. When you and I think about the Holy Spirit as believers, we understand. But what we read about in God's Word is the power of the Holy Spirit came upon her. So we have two things. The negative, no, no man is involved. The Bible's emphatic about that. The no is of human origin. Is there any human input? No. The positive is, it's God. I was on a uh, science website a few days ago, and um, I forget how I got there. It, it was through something about Christmas, 
and the comments. And you know this, like a lot of people follow comments online more than anything else. If you're on entertainment websites, people put comments there. If you're on how to make a cake, then people put comments there. I, I took on Facebook and tried to do a personal page uh, a couple of months ago, I told you, and I posted something, and there were comments there. And I, Oh, nope, that's it. I don't even care. I don't want your comments. I didn't ask you for your comments. I'm not even going to allow you to give them. You can give them somewhere else, but I don't care. Comments. As I read through these just five or six comments on the science site, they attacked every aspect of the virgin birth. They attacked it viciously. They came at it almost irrepressibly. It was as if they, they would do everything within their power to stay up awake night and day, to not eat food or drink water, and just to be able to post how unbelievable this is, how unscientific, how ridiculous, how everything. Well, absolutely, because you have not repented, and you cannot believe it until you repent. When you repent, you will believe it. They go hand in hand. You will talk the language we talk. Doesn't matter how smart you are, what Ivy League school you went to, what degree you have. Doesn't matter how much money they pay you, what the title you have is, how much experience. None of that matters. When you repent, you will talk Jesus talk. We've been doing it for 2,000 years, and we will do it until he returns. Why? Because it was a virgin birth. Do, do, I, do I understand what... Mary was going through what she felt. I have no clue. None. But when my wife was pregnant with our two children, I have, I'm a guy. I have no idea what that experience is like. But here's what I know. Mary had an encounter with God, and Mary was chosen to be the vessel that brought forth God in flesh. And, and there, it's not only that there was no husband involved. It was that there could not be. It was not necessary. God wanted to enter humanity from the position of humanity. If he wanted to enter as God, he could do that anytime. Who kept showing up with all the different Christmas individuals? Gabriel, right? If God wants some entity from heaven, some non-human to show up, he'll have him show up. Not a problem. But if God wants to come among men, then there has to be an explanation. There has to be an understanding. Number one, what does Christmas mean? What is Christmas all about? It is the visitation of light from heaven. Not from a deceiving spirit. Not from Satan who transforms himself into an angel of light. But it is a visitation of light, of the light from heaven. Number two, it is the virgin birth of the Messiah. The Messiah was never understood by the religious leaders to, to be someone who would be born of a virgin. Somehow they were overlooking what Isaiah had prophesied hundreds of years before, but this is the fulfillment of exactly what he said, and it remains the power of the gospel today that Jesus, Galatians 4.4, 4, when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his Son. You and I look back to that and say hallelujah, but we're also with one out of the corner of one eye. We're looking forward to the next time when it's full. The time is complete. The time is full, and God says, I'm sending forth my son again. Hallelujah. Well, I thought that was good. Here's the third thing. Go back to Luke now, chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Don't you love it when you hear me say, here's the third thing? <laughs> Everybody was like, I want to say amen, but I wasn't doing it when he was preaching, so I can't do it when he's joking. <laughs> Luke 2, look at verse 13. <clears throat> suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others. Don't you love God's suddenly? Suddenly. The angel was joined by a vast host of others. The armies of heaven praising God and saying glory to God in the highest heaven, peace on earth 
to those with whom God is pleased. Number three today, the violence of sinners is ended. Those of you joining online, the notes are available. Those of you here, you can get them later as well on the uh, church app. The violence of sinners is ended. Not every sinner, but the sinners who confess. Because the other thing that happens when you and I say, Lord, forgive me, is that the violence in us ends. And that violence is always directed towards God. And especially his son, Jesus Christ. When you and I come to Jesus Christ, we go through the steps that we've looked at here this morning. The Christmas story happens to every one of us. Every person that says yes to the Lord Jesus Christ experiences the miracle of Christmas, the birth of the Lord Jesus in our heart, in our soul, and bringing new life to us. And when that happens, the violence that we were enacting against God is over. And I was thinking of uh, maybe four years ago, Sister Tanya Wharton was here, and that's her maiden name, and her husband spoke about that verse. I don't know, I think it was a Wednesday night, but he just talked about that, and that's always resonated with me. Without full surrender, every man works to vilify God. He's accused, abused, blamed, and defamed, but he remains God. So much so that Jesus said, you can blaspheme God, you can blaspheme his son, and it can be forgiven. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad that that can be forgiven? That no matter what we've thought about God, no matter how mad at him we got, no matter how, what language we used, no matter what we threatened him with or cursed him by or promised to do to him, when we said yes to Jesus, the violence in our soul was immediately ended. Hallelujah. Glory to God in the highest peace on earth or in earth to those with whom God is pleased. Peace has come to us. And the cool thing there in your new living is that there is a, a footnote a letter for the um, reference. And you can trace that word peace through the New Testament. And you can even go to the dictionary and check out some of the meanings. The visitation of light from heaven. The bir virgin birth of the Messiah on earth. And the violence of sinners completely ending. We should not be surprised as we look around in our world and see sinners being even more angry at God. Sometimes you and I interpret this as an uprising against us. Well, we're being marginalized as believers here in the West. We're being erased. <clears throat> um, what's, the, what's that term they're using in technology when they get rid of you? Um, what is it? You know what I mean? They, they can't cancel. And now they call it the cancel culture. If they don't like something that you posted online, everybody just leaves all your... Your friends, all your friends, just <laughs> I just love how Facebook has twisted the meaning. They have literally changed the interpretation of a bedrock terminology, not just in English, but in all of human history in every language. They have literally abandoned the meaning and created a whole new meaning for the term friend. <laughs> but you, you post something that people don't like. You put a picture of you somewhere and defending something of of morality or justice, oh boy, that's it, and they just cancel you. If anything that you declare is contrary to what they believe, and here's what I have found amusing, is that sometimes the person posting it, what they posted would have been fine just six months ago, but nobody sent them the memo that the theology, the, the understanding, the, 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 the doctrine of this group or that group, these offended people or those offended people, their doctrine changed. And now that doesn't matter, this matters. And nobody told this guy or gal, this poor person, and so they put something there on Facebook or on social media, they just posted it on Twitter, and now everybody hates them, and that's it. All their friends just cut them out. And it's like you never existed <laughs> over there in, in fake land. And how devastating. When we come to Jesus, 
all that violence inside of us against God has ended. And all that violence against other humans has ended as well. I'm going to be careful here. I don't want to cross over the military principles and concepts, but I want to speak in general terms. Whenever Jesus is Lord of your life and seated on the throne as king and master, you're able to love people who are unlovable. You're able to love people no matter what their political position or their ideology, ideological stronghold, you're able, let me say it again, you are able to love people like he loved people. And what I fear in this chaotic mess called the United States right now is that the church is getting caught up or has gotten caught up or has done something to have forgotten that principle that whenever Jesus is Lord of your life, he allows you, permits you, empowers you, strengthens you, opens your eyes to see a love for people that you would not have loved any other way. You say, well, they're, just, they're violent against God and I just want to cancel them. We're not participating in the cancel culture. They're they're against everything I hold near and dear. That's right, because they're sinners. I learned a long time ago, I will not do by power what I cannot do by prayer. I will not make happen by force what I cannot cause to happen by faith. And if we can't, our great-great-grandparents in Pentecost knew how to pray all night and they changed their community. If they faced the drug addiction overdose epidemic that we face, they would have long ago moved into the church building. Literally, they would have moved in here, slept on the pews, ate their food out in the front foyer if they ate at all. They would have wept day and night until the thing broke. But we've become so convinced that we can't do it. The government has to do it for us. Thank God he's helping us in these days in which we live and things are getting so oppressive, things are getting so difficult that the church is finally going to say, whoa, time out. We we have the answer. We have the deliverance. We have the healing. We have the miracle. We have Jesus because God sent him 2,000 years ago and the miracle of his presence is still with us, not just because he was born, not just because he died, but because he lives forever. He did not just die and people made up a story, well, he's really alive. He rose from the dead. He was seen by this one and that one. And then 500 at a time, he was in evidence as alive. I had a law official tell me yesterday after a funeral, after Brother Simmons' funeral, that um, I mentioned that verse where Paul says, you know, all these people saw him. He said, you know, that's the strongest testimony that there can be in a court trial, and that's testimony of multiple eyewitnesses, all corroborated. There is no stronger testimony. He is the miracle. He's with us today and every day, and when you and I engage with him when we work with the king of glory when we walk with the prince of peace when we surrender to the messiah light from heaven good things begin to happen in us and to us and god begins to open the doors and make a way and the power of the lord leads us and guides us and god says you're my son you're my daughter my purpose is working in you now and the meaning of heaven becomes clear not just on december 25 but on every day of the year that God's purpose is our purpose. That God's purpose is to redeem us and to have us with him forever. Hallelujah. Bow your hearts with me this morning please. Jesus thank you for the miracle of the Messiah. Thank you that you are the king of glory. That you have redeemed us from among men and that you have saved us for your purposes and how we thank you for that. Praise God. Church, your heads are bowed for just a moment.
I want to talk to those of you who might be here, but especially those of you watching who are still rejecting the Messiah, still unsure, undecided. Some anger residing inside. Maybe your childhood was difficult. Maybe abuse came into your life and you're still angry at God. I understand life is horrible. And for some, it seems that it's been horrible more than it should have been. But I can tell you the same grace of God that has worked in millions of believers down through the years is available to work in you. And you might say, well, even if I say yes to Jesus, I still have all of that in my past. But he does an amazing thing. The Lord Jesus has the power to take your story and change its direction. He takes your story and suddenly all of those things that were so oppressive to you now become so empowering to you. It's a miracle. I can't even explain it. I have no idea, but God does it. He's done it for us over and over, all of us who follow the Lord, and he'll do it for you. But I want you to understand, it does not begin with you waking up someday and saying, well, maybe there is a God. It begins with you saying, Lord, forgive me. And when you do that, a belief comes alive within you. The supernatural takes over the natural. And something that's in you comes alive. Something there that you often felt but had never tapped into. If you've never, never met the Lord Jesus, I want you to do that today. I beg you in this Christmas season of 2020, as things continue to be confusing and overwhelming, I beg you to make Jesus Lord of your life and to have the Messiah in your heart. And when you do, God is going to make powerful, and powerful things happen for you. He's not a light. He is the light from heaven. And he comes to give eternal life. Father, thank you today for the power of the gospel. Thank you for reminding us every day of the miracle of Christmas, the majesty of the Messiah. Thank you that there's victory through Jesus. Thank you for the virgin birth. Thank you for the visitation. And thank you that the violence of our hearts against you has ended. And we have peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. Stand with me this morning, church, all over the house. The altar's open this morning. If you, uh, if you want to take a few moments anywhere in the altar for a Christmas time with the Lord Jesus, please do. I know we'll be in here on Wednesday or Thursday, excuse me, but if you want to do that this morning, you're welcome. If you'd like me to pray with you, I'd be happy to do that as well. But if you'd make an altar there in your pew and just say to the Lord, Hallelujah. Father, thank you for Christmas. Thank you for the, for the message of your love wrapped in flesh. Yeah, that flesh was wrapped in swaddling clothes, but isn't that a picture of what was really happening? That the message of God's love was wrapped in humanity. That little baby born so long ago. Hallelujah. And um, if you'll make that altar there at your seat, I trust God will talk to you. Brother Ricky's going to lead us in a a song, and then we're going to um, get out of here and enjoy God's goodness in Christmas of 20, in spite of everything happening to those of us who sit in the shadow of death. The light has come. Amen. God bless you.